We continue this morning in our sermon series entitled, Needed. And we've been focusing on things that we need in the midst of the challenges that we live through. I want you to just take a moment and consider the last three or four mornings of this week. How many times have you awakened this week and felt like already you needed something? Perhaps you opened your eyes and even having just slept, felt like you needed more rest. Or as the events of the day to come began to fill your heart and mind, you needed a deeper peace to hold you. Perhaps as you thought back over circumstances or situations that you dealt with yesterday, you needed a sense of steadiness or a sense of justice that might prevail. Or please God, a sense of normalcy. Or maybe even that deep longing for a sense of God's presence or God's answer. These needs, needs that I would argue the church, the body of Christ, the living witness of Jesus Christ is uniquely positioned to fill, are needs that I believe many of us are wrestling with today. And the way in which God responds to these needs is so deeply counter-cultural that I believe we as the people, imperfect and broken and challenged as we are, we the people who together make up the body of Christ in this world, we have a witness that the world needs. I can already hear the questions fill the world's needs Pastor Jen, how is that possible? I'm barely holding on by a bobby pin or by my fingernails or by just a thread. How many of you feel like you're just barely holding on? But if we are who we say we are, those who stand in God's strength and not ours, those who are filled by God's spirit and not led by our own needs, if we are, those who are new creations with Christ inside of us, we have a response to what the world needs now. We talked about two weeks ago a deep need that exists for the sacred. And I just want to name this again because I feel like it is so present the hardness, the exhaustion, the challenge that nothing is as easy as it seems or we think it should be leaves us with a deep need of the sacred, that place where God's spirit just comes, that place where it's not about whether we had the strength to respond appropriately, that place where it is about a power not our own. When we really lean into the sacred and the sacramental, it's the need we have for beauty and power and grace beyond what we see. When have you needed the sacred this week? I don't know about you, but I have had in my head since last week that Second Corinthians 5 scripture, and for whatever reason, this small piece has just stuck in my heart. We regard no one from a human point of view, Paul says, because in Christ we are all made new. I believe it's tied to the need for the sacred and the need to live in grace. What if today you and I saw each other, ourselves, our family, our church, even the leadership, not from a human point of view. But we began to see the work of God even in places that we can't believe. Michelin Hope, a member of Epworth, was part of one of our prayer gatherings this week. And I, I invite you, every Wednesday at 6 a.m. and now every Tuesday at 6 p.m., there are a group of us that gather using that worship link on the website, and we pray together. 
And it's not the same as being in the same space, but there is a movement of God. And in her prayer, Michelin said, God, teach us to trust you, even when we can't trace you. Teach us to trust you. Teach us to regard no one from simply a human point of view. Teach us to believe, God, that you are at work even in the places where we cannot see evidence. Teach us to trust you when it feels like injustice and lies and evil are triumphing. Teach us to trust that there is more to this world than what we see. The second thing we've talked about needing is a need for grace. And I, I feel like we don't internalize this either. We need grace and the ability to believe that it is not predetermined. That if the past and the mistakes and the words and the decisions that we made yesterday predetermine whatever will happen today or into the future, no wonder we live with a sense of hopelessness. But God through Christ was always about the possibility of change the possibility of waking up anew and recommitting, of waking up and deciding to live in a different sense of grace, of beginning anew in relationships. God was about reconciling the world to himself. We need grace, and especially in this pandemic. I've had people say to me, Pastor Dan, I feel like I'm blaming things on this pandemic that really shouldn't impact. And yet, the reality is everything is harder. And what if we were to live with a deeper sense of grace for ourselves and for those around us? And today, today we are to be looking at the way in which you and I need an opportunity to give and to serve. And I think the realities of this pandemic, we often talk about how deeply we miss human contact. We miss that ability to hug each other. I was privileged to be able to walk with Ferial Ricks and Ethan Bauer yesterday in the celebration of life of Gregory Ricks, and yet it is hard in grief and in need to not be able to hug. There are places where human contact simply says more than words ever could. We miss the opportunity to gather with those that we love, and Destiny was one who said, as we move into Thanksgiving and Christmas and all the holiday season, not only will we grieve those opportunities to be together, but we will also feel more acutely the places that those relationships aren't fitting together like we wish they would. We miss the opportunities to move, to be free, to respond. And yet, how often do we think about the fact that we miss the opportunity to give and to serve? If you and I are made in the image and likeness of God, and God says so specifically that God through Christ came to the world to serve and not be served, then there is something integral to our being, something that is fed and brought alive, a place that the Spirit moves when we are given opportunity to give and to serve. And I actually believe that those opportunities exist for us now, but we have to think creatively and work harder. As I was thinking about God's call to give and to serve, the passage from, from Matthew Chapter 20, beginning with verse 20, where the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, and she kneels before Jesus, and she asks him a favor. And Jesus says to this woman in Matthew 20, 21, what do you want? And she says to Jesus, I want you to declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left. And Jesus says to her, you don't even know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And the two sons 
speak now instead of their mother, they say, we are able. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten other disciples heard about this interchange, they were angry with the brothers. And Jesus called them to him and he said, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. Resonate at all? A model of leadership and power and authority and public service that lords over, that acts as a tyrant, that uses ego and strength to smash, not to serve. It will not be so among you, Jesus said. But whichever of you wishes to be great, you have to first be a servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you has to first be a slave. Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. What might it mean if in this sense that you and I need opportunities to give and to serve, Jesus starts us back 20 paces and says, yes, you need the opportunity to give and to serve, but do you really know what you're asking? Are you really prepared to drink from the cup that I drink before I give my life as a ransom for many? Jesus seems to always point us to a different question, to a different way of being. And it seemed to resonate with an article that I read that spoke to the difference between seeking validation and serving. And I think this is really important because in the midst of this pandemic, we're all a little bit crazy, amen? A little bit crazy and a little bit desperate. Desperate to hold on to our sense of self, desperate to return to the normal, desperate to feel that sense of God with us, desperate. And in that desperation, we can easily, I believe, seek to give or to serve out of a need to be validated, not out of genuine love. The article I read was an individual sharing very honestly about how they came to understand that many of the acts of service in their life, perhaps like James and John, asking to sit at the left and the right, were an effort to find validation. Seeking validation for what they did or were. How many times on social media do we find validation by posting something Recently, I posted a picture of our family on, on the, the trip we took to the Adirondack Mountains. And after about 200 plus comments, my husband said to me, I sure hope people know that our family is as crazy as everybody else. I sure hope that that picture posted out there doesn't somehow speak to the fact that everything in this house is all together. How many times do we put things out there seeking validation? How many times do we serve others seeking to be liked, needing to say no, but really saying yes, or serving out of a desperate need to be wanted? The kind of service and giving Jesus talks about begins with a willingness to drink the cup in the garden. Not my will, God, but yours be done. I think we've seen this over and over again. And certainly in a current political context, how many things are not photo opportunities? Places in which leadership uses the act of service as a way to somehow validate their integrity. But Jesus was about something so, so different than that. Our scripture for today from Luke 6. I chose it because at the very end, Luke 6, 38, there is the famous text that speaks about giving generously. 
giving generously and having it given back to you, a great measure shaken down, pushed together, overflowing, and that the measure with which you give will be the measure with which you receive. But I point you to the fact that that scripture actually begins with the Beatitudes. Jesus doesn't start by talking about giving generously and therefore receiving abundant blessings. Jesus, in verse 20 of chapter 6 of Luke, begins with the Beatitudes, looking intently at his followers, teaching them that in the moments of trial, in the moments of struggle, in the moments of challenge, are actually the moments when we start to understand love and service and God's power in different ways. In your bulletin, all of the scripture is printed from the Passion Translation. It's actually not a translation that I'm super familiar with, but I love how it spoke in a common language. Hear these words as Jesus teaches us the place from which we must give. Looking intently at his followers, Jesus began his sermon, how enriched you become when you're poor. Because when you're poor, you will experience the reality of God's kingdom realm. That's that juxtaposition between the human sense and the spiritual sense. How filled you become, Jesus says, when you are consumed with hunger and desire. Like that desperate sense when you wake up every morning. Jesus says, for you in me will be completely satisfied. How content you become when you weep with complete brokenness. For you laugh with unrestrained joy. There is something powerful about the moments of deepest pain that if we stick with God, lead us to places of unknown joy. How favored you become when you are hated or excommunicated or slandered or when your name is spoken of as evil because of your love for me, the Son of Man. How many people have criticized you this week? Spoken unkindly, of what you've done or not done. Jesus says, I promise you that as you experience these things, you will celebrate and dance with overflowing joy and the heavenly reward of your faith will be abundant because you're being treated the same way as your forefathers, the prophets. But what sorrows await those of you who are rich in this life only? For you've already received all the comfort you'll ever get. We've talked about how, in moments of trial, we are faced with the possibility to have all that we see before us or to go deeper, deeper, deeper into who God is. What sorrows await those of you who laugh now, having received all your joy in this life only, for grief and wailing will come to you? What sorrows await those of you who are always honored and lauded by others. For that's how your forefathers treated every other false prophet. Now Jesus turns, pay attention, verse 27. But if you will listen, I'll say to you, love your enemies and do something wonderful for them in return for their hatred. Now, God, in the midst of this ugly dialogue, when someone curses you, bless that person in return. When you are mistreated and harassed by others, accept it as your mission to pray for them. To those who despise you, continue to serve them and minister to them. If someone takes away your coat, give him as a gift your shirt as well. When someone comes to beg from you, give to that person what you have. When things are wrongly taken from you, do not demand that they be given back. However you wish to be treated by others is how you should treat everyone else. As if Jesus wasn't already messing enough. Especially in this current context in which we have become divided. Those who are enemies and those who are allies. Jesus says, are you really showing true love by only loving those who love you back? Even those who don't know God will do that. 
Are you really showing compassion when you do good deeds only to those who do good deeds to you? Even those who don't know God will do that. If you lend money only to those you know will repay, what credit is that to your character? If those who don't know God do even that. But love your enemies. Continue to treat them well. When you lend money, don't despair if you're never paid back, for it's not lost. You will receive a rich reward and will be known as children of the Most High God. For your Father is famous for his kindness to heal even the thankless and the cruel. Show mercy and compassion for others, just as your Heavenly Father overflows with mercy and compassion for all. I believe that we as the body of Christ are called to have a clear and constant witness for justice. That we are called to speak up and to speak out in the face of racism, in the face of homophobia, in the face of rejection and hatred and denial. And I also believe that Jesus always offers a third way. A third way of standing for justice and truth, but at the same time doing so with an abiding sense of mercy and compassion and God's continual forgiving grace. We forgive because God first forgave us. Love because God first loved us. So we move from understanding that those who are marginalized in this world are those who actually most clearly can see the kingdom of God to a sense that you and I are called to love our enemies even now because you know now that the hatred that begins to dwell deep within your heart eventually erodes your capacity to live in the sacred and the grace-filled and the God. And finally, Jesus takes it to the last step, forsaking the habit of criticizing and judging others. Jesus says in Luke 6, 37, stop criticizing and judging others. And then you will not be criticized and judged in return. Don't look at others and pronounce them guilty, and you will not experience guilty accusations yourself. Forgive over and over, and you will be forgiven over and over. And we finally get to verse 38. So out of that heart, out of that spirit of love, out of that stand against criticism, out of that posture of compassion, out of that willingness to drink the cup with Jesus, Jesus says, give generously, and generous gifts will be given back to you shaken down to make room for more abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure, it'll run over the top. And your measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. You and I need opportunities to give and to serve, but not to justify our righteousness, not to fill our time, not as a quick excuse to be in contact with others, not as a way to validate ourselves. You and I need to be given opportunities to give and to serve because we have been so changed by God's love for us. The Passion Translation of John 15, 12 says, this is my command, not just love each other, Love each other deeply, as much as I have loved you. For the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices. And this great love is demonstrated when a person sacrifices his life for his friends. One of the things that I am grateful to God for is the provision of produce for our food distribution ministry. Some of you know that for at least three weeks, the USDA grant that provided produce for all of the food distribution that we do was frozen. My husband, Edgar, and I were going using resources you have contributed from the pastor's discretionary fund, using resources to purchase bulk produce. 
and those who are a part of that ministry were praying, asking that God would provide. And last week, to God be the glory, Oscar and Reina, who are leading that initiative, packed more bags of food freely given through a source in this county than we had ever had before. To me, that's an example of that basket being shaken down and overflowing in abundance. When our hearts are in the place not to be validated, not to fill our time, not to be justified as righteous or the next great leader, but when we are seeking to serve out of a deep love for others that calls for our sacrifice, God provides. We need that. We need the opportunity to give ourselves for others. We need the opportunity to love deeply. And I know in this time, it is hard to find the places where we can do that. But I exhort you, I encourage you, I beg you, do not give in to the current culture that divides you from the rest of the world. Do not allow the pandemic to pull you so deeply within yourself that you stop looking for the sacred beauty and grace of God around you. Do not allow your heart to believe the narrative that you cannot begin again and that change isn't possible and grace is a farce. You and I, the body of Christ, have this third way that Jesus offers. That's not about who sits at his left and who sits at his right. It's about the willingness to drink that cup with Jesus. The willingness to sacrifice for others. The willingness, even in the face of criticism, to minister and serve others. The willingness to love. The willingness to love. That never means that we don't stand for justice. At Greg Rick's funeral yesterday, somebody quoted him as saying, and I've heard this before, that activism and work for social justice is the public witness to love. And so we need to forgive and love interpersonally. And we need to love out loud and publicly. But our hearts always need to be attentive to the God who forgives us and gives us grace by God's amazing love. I'll just say yes You lead the way I'm not afraid of what it means for me to say this life you gave is not my own. I'm trusting you to hear my yes and lead me on. Yes, Lord. 